Morning everybody, David Shapiro here with another video. So my systems thinking series was rather popular uh, and I actually had to take a while to get to episode three because I had to do spend time basically unpacking how my own brain works to articulate it very clearly. Now I am ready and so here we go. Uh, before we get started, just a quick plug for my Patreon. Uh, I do all my videos for free. I'm uh, closing in, aiming for about 150 videos this year between the, the, uh, this channel and my main channel. Um, I would prefer to keep doing this. So if you uh, consider supporting me on Patreon, every little bit helps, and it'll allow me to continue doing this indefinitely. All right, so today's video about systems thinking is about first principles or first principles thinking. And so there's a few other common things that you can might know these by. Uh, foundational principles, axioms, so like there's engineering axioms or scientific axioms or whatever. Universal principles, uh, yeah, universal principles, core assumptions, basic assertions, um, these kinds of things. So lots of people talk about it, most famously Elon Musk, where he's like, oh, first principles thinking, and everyone's like, what does that mean? Uh, so I'm here to tell you, one, how that, what it actually means, but more importantly, how to do it and how to practice it. Before we get into that, though, uh, we really have to uh, unpack uh, epistemics, which is the theory of knowledge or the study of knowledge. How do you know what you know? So there's two primary philosophies or intellectual movements that you need to know about over the last 100 to 150 years. So first is modernism. Modernism uh, came about after the Enlightenment. Uh, basically, modernism, uh, from, a, from a scientific and, and intellectual standpoint, uh, basically says there are absolute truths out there. Science and rationality can prove everything. Um, that the narratives or meta narratives, the overarching explanations for how the universe works, actually exist. Uh, and so, what you have to remember is that this was a departure from more uh, dogmatic, superstitious, and spiritual interpretations of the world. So, as secularism was on the rise, people are like, "Oh, what do we replace this with?" Because before. It was, you know, there's transcendentalism and, and all the various interpretations about uh, the way that the world works through the lens of religion and God and that sort of thing. So it was a very modern way of thinking to say, like, hey, maybe uh, maybe evolution is a thing. Because remember when Charles Darwin came up, uh, that was a thing. Now, what happened after that, though, was that uh, science was still limited in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And so there were there were failures, there was inabilities to explain certain things. And after you know a century of being frustrated uh, and unable to explain everything, uh, a bunch of Parisians got together and said, well, maybe truth actually isn't universal. Maybe there are just too many exceptions. Maybe uh, it's all very subjective and squishy. And so they basically just threw it out wholesale. And part of the reason that this happened was because the very Western-centric world, Europe and America, started having more contact with other cultures around the world, uh, the Muslim world, uh, the Eastern Asian, uh, particularly also uh, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and South America. So the Global South had very different uh, ways of looking at the world, and so there were no universal truths. And so the idea was that, oh, well, maybe, maybe we don't know what truth is. Maybe truth doesn't even exist. And so this is the paradigm that we've been in for the last 50 or so years, 50 to 70 years, where the idea is truth doesn't exist. Truth is subjective. Question everything, yada, yada, yada. It's all very uh, 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 meta, I guess you could say. Uh, and so I included this little graphic about the, about the uh, kind of the, the pyramid of, of knowledge. And so at, a, at the fundamental level, the world is just data. Uh, so data is the raw signal that you get from your instruments, from your eyes. Uh, well, actually, what you see, what your eyes pick up is data, but what you actually see is um, information because it's already been distilled. And so this, this pyramid represents subsequent levels of distillation uh, and, and uh, extraction of meaning about information. And so... The reason that I have this here is because conventional wisdom is at the top, and we laud conventional wisdom, but conventional wisdom might be wrong. And that is one of the biggest strengths of postmodernism. So what you think you know, and the wisdom that you think you have, 
is entirely built on cultural foundations. Not entirely. I'm not going to say that. Um, but it is certainly influenced by, by cultural foundations. And this is one thing that modern science tries to do is to uh, get, get underneath all of those things. And this is where first principles uh, thinking comes in because the, the, the first principles uh, speak to how you interpret data. So first principles or axiomatic assumptions uh, are the are the, the the rules of the road, the framework that you use to in, to convert data into information and interpret the information into knowledge and transmute it into wisdom. So that's why this graphic is here. So let's unpack postmodernism just a little bit more. So if you hear things like truth is subjective and there's no such thing as truth and et cetera, et cetera, we live in a post-truth era. This is the fundamental nature of postmodernism. And while the, the term post-truth era is a relatively new term, uh, basically it started in the 60s in Paris or 50s in Paris. So we live in a world of alternative facts. Now, from a rhetorical standpoint, um, this is nothing new. Uh, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte was famous for uh, being able to spin things. Uh, so the power of narrative, the power of story has always been true. And so then this is why I have up here that truth is beliefs, evidence, interpretation, and consensus. And of course, these are uh, e these can be easily manipulated by a clever speaker. Um, and so this is this is kind of my social definition of truth. So what is true to one group of people will be different to another group of people. And this is called an epistemic tribe, actually. So anyways, um, yep, yeah, where were we? Oh, yeah, so... Because one, some of the some of the core ideas of postmodernism have been embedded in the zeitgeist, uh, but most people don't understand epistemics as much as someone who studies it. You end up with some basically thought-stopping platitudes like everything is a social construct, or all perspectives are equally valid, or language creates re creates reality. So these are very, very overly simplified platitudes that come from postmodernism, and they are basically weaponized in politics and debate and uh, in the news media. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that this is that the postmodernism is basically an intellectual temper tantrum because the colonial West couldn't reconcile its beliefs and positions with the uh, beliefs, positions, and views around the world. Um, and so essentially postmodernism is a uh, highly colonized way of thinking. Uh, and basically uh, it's kind of an intellectual crab mentality where the Western establishment said, well, if I can't be the arbiter of, of truth, then maybe nobody can. Let's just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now, that being said, postmodernism has some, some real strengths. First, question everything and reject all dogma. This is an incredibly powerful thing because uh, like some of the advan advantages of it is question patriarchy, pa pa uh, question racism, question the status quo. Postmodernism is what the, mo the intellectual movement that finally allowed for people like the hippies and others to push for civil rights and women's rights and that sort of thing. Uh, because it's like, well, we've been operating under the assumption that men are intellectually superior to women for centuries. But let's question that. And so with postmodernism, nothing is sacred, which that is actually a good thing. But if you take it too far, you end up being very cynical and nihilistic. And then finally, if you continuously appeal to the fact that nothing is sacred and nobody knows anything, then you, you say nobody is the arbiter of truth. There is no such thing as truth. My truth is uh, the only thing that I care about, and you end up with misinformation and disinformation. So these are two sides of the same coin, where you are allowed to question everything, and you should question everything, but it is possible to take it too far. So how did I, how did I even come to this understanding of postmodernism? This is an example of, of first principles thinking, uh, and we will now unpack how to engage in this level of first principles thinking. All right, so I already mentioned the most famous first principles thinker is uh, Elon Musk. So the, the story is rather simple, and I don't know if he actually had this conversation or if, uh, if somebody else you know, gave him the idea and he took it and ran with it. Either way, whatever. He wanted to build a space company, so he said, why are rockets so expensive? Well, because rockets are treated as disposable. Okay, well, what if we don't treat them as disposable? 
it was a it was a, a a foundational assumption because of how difficult rocket retrieval would be that every time you sent a rocket up to space, either some of it would be left in space or some of it would crash into the ocean. And either way, you'd have to start with a brand new rocket every single time. Um, and so then Elon Musk with SpaceX has said, well, why don't we just reuse them? Why don't we just land the rockets and reuse them? And now some of the uh, some of the the Falcon nines have been reused like I don't know twenty times, thirty times. Uh, so and of course, rather than you know having a million dollars or you know several million dollars worth of rocket engines crash into the ocean just to be lost forever, you get to use them multiple times. So this is the good part of postmodernism. You question the esta- the academic establishment. Just because the universities and the professors and the emeritus and tenure track professors say so doesn't mean that it's actually true. And of course, the academic establishment has been the arbiter of you know truth and facts for a very long time. Um, you also question the zeitgeist. So the zeitgeist is conventional wisdom, the spirit of the times. You can question common sense. You can question the general consensus. By questioning everything, by challenging dogma, that allows you to get to new uh, new places. All right, so first, unpack assumptions. Uh, this is the first step of first principles thinking. You have to uh, explore the assumptions that you're making. And actually, this is a fun exercise that you can do with ChatGPT. You say like, okay, this is what I believe, blah, 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 blah. And then say, uh, get you know, do a deep evaluation. What are all the assumptions that I'm making? What are the underpinning assumptions uh, that I'm making about this thing? And it's really good at uh, at doing that, and it's a very fun exercise, and it'll actually uh, teach you more about how you think, um, and and the under things that underlying things that must be true in order for those beliefs that you carry to actually be effective. So uh, there's uh, three primary vectors that we get assumptions from. One is familial and otherwise inherited uh, beliefs. So just things, casual things that you hear from your parents when you're a child, they tend to stick in your mind a lot. Um, Even once you learn better uh, later on in life, you might still default back to that original memory. Uh, Likewise, cultural cultural and social beliefs uh, tend to be very, very sticky. Uh, These come from everything from the radio and television and internet and just the people that you see on a daily basis because you are geographically constrained um, to a particular region or or also another epistemic tribe such as online communities. And so these will continuously, I'll say indoctrinate because that sounds like, like it's not, it's not a conscious effort though. You, you assimilate into various cultural and epistemic tribes which then you just you you'll get a lot of implied or unconscious assumptions without even realizing that you're getting them. And then finally, education, formal rigorous education uh, does tend to indoctrinate people into certain patterns of thought. So the metaphor that I like to use is that you're a goldfish in a bowl. Um, you have only known the gold the, the 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 glass walls of the bowl and the water. You don't know what it's like outside of the goldfish bowl. You don't know what the glass is or why it's there. As far as you're concerned, that is the edge of the universe. And you can see outside of it, but you can't go there. So one thing that you can do to unpack your assumptions, other than ask ChatGPT to challenge your assumptions, is you zoom out. You take a big step back. And I talked about this in my uh, uh, systems thinking episode two, taking perspectives. Excuse me. Um, So first, there's the temporal context. Look at the timelines. What led to your beliefs here? One thing that's very interesting and and usually very elucidating is when you reverse engineer your current beliefs based on how you got here and like everything that happened uh, from historical events to family history to global history, scientific history. Basically, look at the history of everything that led to your current beliefs. And in in those cases, many things will become very, very clear. And so, for instance, as I've been recovering from burnout, one of the things that I've done is learned about the work ethic of America. How did we get to this workaholic uh, place? There's a tremendous amount of cultural baggage that led us here, and I'll be right back. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Yes, so the historical context, because... uh, 
all the ideas and beliefs and, and assumptions that you have didn't get there on accident. And many of them get just kind of get embedded as something as simple as old wives tales. There's lots and lots of other ideas uh, beyond the example that I just gave. Uh, for instance, sometimes a, a fact or belief will be injected, like the idea that you lose 90% of your heat through your head. Uh, that is a drastic mis misunderstanding of a study that was done in, I think, Poland or Germany or something. Anyways, the original study was actually someone uh, trying to figure out how much uh, heat soldiers lost through their head while they're sleeping under a like uh, feather comforter or whatever in the in the in a cold environment um, and so yes if you're under in a, in a very very warm bed and and your head is not uh, covered then yes you lose 90 percent of your heat through your head under normal circumstances that is not true the second way you can zoom out zoom out is your uh, geographic context your physical context today and so this is what I'm what I meant by like epistemic tribes. So where you are in a city or a state or the country, uh, there's going to be a lot of conventions in that particular area, uh, as well as you know the hemisphere of the planet that you're in, the language that you speak, uh, the religion, the the legal system that you are uh, influenced by. All of these things will give you various assumptions. And um, of course, you know, going back to the idea of perspective taking, one of the best ways to challenge your assumptions and perspective is to learn about another one, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, so comparing and contrasting, uh, this is this is uh, uh, this is one way to uh, kind of shine a light on those assumptions that you're making. So particularly from a cultural context, the more you study other cultures, because at first they're going to feel very, very foreign, very alien to you. Um, but the more you study them, the more you can understand their way of thinking and their way of, of believing and just their way of being, uh, which is a really good way of making you conscious of the way that you live. So remember, if you're the goldfish and then you spend a little bit of time living as a lizard, you're going to see, oh, my world is actually really different from that of a lizard. And so uh, when these other cultures, these other schools of thinking feel very unfamiliar, it's very, very common to just mentally categorize them as other, to diminish them and reject them. Uh, but uh, this is just because humans have a very strong preference for familiarity. So you work to make these other schools of thought more familiar, and you will see, you will see the differences, compare and contrast, and this will make you a more well-rounded thinker. Okay, number two for uh, this uh, for first principles thinking is elegant simplicity. So this is a quotation. It's one of my favorite quotations of all time. He didn't really say this, but it's it's close to something that he said. Uh, but Einstein, uh, this is often attributed to Einstein. You don't truly understand something unless you can explain it to your grandmother. Uh, and the idea there is very powerful, where. If you have a hard time explaining something, you don't fully understand it yet. And uh, once you do have a mastery of something, you can teach it to basically anyone. And most things, particularly in physics, uh, but many things kind of come down to very elegantly simple descriptions. They're easily defensible axiomatic assertions. So for instance, E equals MC squared, incredibly elegant, very simple. Um, and there's not much else to, to really say about that. Uh, but, uh, one thing that I can, that I will point out is that if you don't fully understand something, what many people do is they'll wrap more and more layers of logic and rules and exceptions to things because they don't actually understand the underlying principle. And so in this case, when, uh, when the Parisians created postmodernism and they're like, oh, well, you know, truth is subjective, truth is this, blah, 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 blah. So they, they, they wrapped truth, the idea of truth, in all kinds of like just logical gymnastics uh, because they were making a different set of fundamental uh, assumptions and they had not actually gotten to the correct, elegantly simple truth of the way that the world works. So for instance, uh, they hadn't come up with the idea of epistemic tribes, right? The idea that there are uh, adap adaptive benefits to humans, just in general, being mentally flexible and able to adapt to different cultures and different tribal schemes. Um, that is a far more simple and elegant solution than just how 
freaking confusing postmodernism is. So if you're trying to get to foundational principles, optimize for elegance and clarity. So this is a Feynman diagram. Richard Feynman was, uh, he's been what? He got a Nobel Prize in physics, voted the seventh most important physicist of all time, helped with the atomic weapons program, quantum computing, and nanotechnology. Now, not everything can be distilled down into such clarity, but many things can. So tectonic theory. Like when you're trying to come up with an explanation for why do volcanoes happen? Why do earthquakes happen? Why do subduction zone happens? How does subsidence happen? How does like, why, why do uh, continents seem to move around? When you have all these disparate facts, we take it as we take it for granted that we understand tectonic plate theory today. But remember that just over a hundred years ago, this was not accepted theory, but the tectonic plate theory was uh, an elegantly simple solution that uh, accurately described everything. So that you can also call that Occam's razor. Newton's laws of motion, very, very simple uh, laws of motion that have proven to be uh, very robust. Uh, free market economics, the idea that, uh, that the market will price things accordingly based on supply and demand. Charles Darwin's nat theory of natural selection. And then of course my own work on heuristic imperatives I got to those by continuously looking for what are the most foundational core principles here that are elegant and simple. Because the thing is, is when something is elegant and simple, uh, then it should be uh, also robust and defensible, but also very useful. Number three, cross-pollination. So one really good way to get to first principles thinking is to cross-pollinate or cross-train your brain. So over-specialize and you breed in weakness. This is absolutely true. Siloed thinking um, with, or insular thinking is very often the case, uh, particularly in Western academics. Uh, but basically, you end up with academic pride and other stuff like snootyism kind of creating this siloed effect where you are deliberately not allowed. This is, this is, a, this is a convention, an unspoken convention in many academic disciplines where you're literally not allowed to borrow the language or, or um, information from another discipline. I remember there was a tweet going around recently where a biologist had basically reinvented calculus because they needed to solve a particular problem, but they didn't know calculus. So they just said, oh, hey, here's the derivative of a curve and blah, blah, blah. And they use the wrong terminology. And everyone's like, did this biologist never take math? Um, <laughs> And so some of the reasons that this happens, particularly in the, uh, in the ivory tower and the academic establishment, is because, uh, one, uh, conformance is reinforced through entrenched power structures. You must exemplify this department, and if you go to that other department for anything, even if you ask them for a cup of sugar, you are a traitor. Um, conformance is expected, and nonconformance is deeply, deeply punished. Um, this is also has to do with the legacy of colonialism and patriarchy, particularly in Western universities. And so, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, intellectual pride or intellectual insecurity, where a lot of Westerners pr still prefer to think that the Western way of thinking is the correct way of thinking. Uh, and so because of all that, it's like, oh, well, if you're not from the... I've literally had many, many professors... Uh, kind of message me about some of my work early on. And when, when I don't have a PhD, they literally just stop talking. Because, and uh, my wife and other explained it to me, where uh, American professors are so concerned about their reputation that they can't even be seen interacting with the ruffians, with the people outside of the establishment. And so because of this, the academic establishment very, very strongly rejects any ideas that did not come from the establishment. And someone told me that Silicon Valley is, is much the same, where it's like, if it wasn't invented here, if it wasn't invented in Silicon Valley, then clearly it's of no value because we have the smartest people in the world. And so whatever came from outside clearly has no value. Um, so yeah, challenge all that. Use postmodernism correctly. Challenge the establishment, challenge the status quo, uh, break those power structures, um, and, uh, study unrelated disciplines. So for instance, uh, philosophy really honestly cannot make heads or tails of human morality. Um, 
And the simple conclusion is because philosophy is the wrong tool for the job. If you keep going to the hardware store for milk, you're not going to ever get milk from the hardware store. But if you look at uh, human morality and ethics through the lens of, say, evolution or neuroscience or any number or economic theory, suddenly morality makes a lot more sense. So basically, you need to look at a, a, a variety of disciplines in order to get the bigger picture. So cross-training your brain. Uh, cross-training your brain is uh, just as valuable as cross-training your body if you are an athlete. So creative hobbies, uh, particularly for people in STEM careers, achieve higher success, more recognition, and solve problems better. Um, just as your body benefits from a variety of ex exercises and activities, so does your brain. Uh, now, that being said, uh, you know, if you decide to mix psychology and neuroscience and philosophy and, you know, anthropology and whatever, like that is going to uh, provide you with more generalizations, more insights, and you're going to be able to remix those. And you'll also kind of start to see uh, patterns emerge. So, uh, and this, this also happens for less intellectual things. So for instance, my dad told me a story many years ago. He was a welder uh, when he was in his uh, late teens, early 20s. And so he was a welder and then, uh, you know, you weld, you weld up a piece of equipment and then you pass it on to the paint shop and the paint shop is like, you guys really suck at this. And, and he's like, no, no, we don't like we're good welders. And so what they did was they, they had all the welders do painting for a day so that they could see how their flaws and their mistakes carried forward. And so then by having the welders be painters for a day, then they're like, oh, I see what actually matters in my work for the next step. Uh, you, you often see a lot of cross training in more intellectual jobs, like developers need to spend a day in infrastructure or IT or in product or DevOps or whatever. Um, and so this is also a big reason why managers often come up doing the job that you're doing now or something very similar is because they've been there, they've done it. Um, but yeah, so cross pollination, cross training your brain, very important. Uh, another way of thinking about this is to be, is to be transdisciplinary. So the old word for this is being a polymath. So polymath is someone who basically knows everything, which uh, at the beginning of the modern university system in the 15th century, it was actually possible to learn everything. Um, if you were graduated, it's because you took literally every class that the university offers. But then, of course, as more and more specialization uh, and more knowledge was accumulated, that became less and less possible. So you had to have a specialization. But Point being is that a lot of people are over-specialized. And so what happens is you might have a multidisciplinary team where you've got, you know, person A, B, C, and D all working on the same problem. Uh, you might have an interdisciplinary team where, you know, you have two teams kind of synthesize their stuff. Or you get, uh, you, you get all of that into one person. And so to be transdisciplinary means that you study all the different things. You study the intersection of many different disciplines. This is the best way to cross train your brain. Um, and this is also how you can be a polymath or a genius or whatever. Uh, it's not an accident. It's something that uh, you very deliberately do. I have done this instinctively my entire life because I saw that there was very obvious value and merit in pulling from different schools of thought. What I learned from fic, uh, from from picking up the art of fiction helped me with science and so on and so forth. You're, if if you deliberately cross train your brain and look for those insights, you will inevitably be smarter and uh, better at systems thinking and better at discovering first principles. Number four is analytical third space. So. I thought somebody else invented this term. I I was I read it on like a forum or something, but every time I look for analytical third space, I can't find anyone defining it the way that I originally saw it. Um, and it's also, there's like four examples on the internet. So this is a neologism, I guess. But there's a couple of quotations out there which tell me that people knew what analytical third space was uh, for literally thousands of years. So it is the mark of an educated mind to entertain an idea without accepting it. Aristotle might have said that or something like it. 
Um, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. F. Scott Fitzgerald. So that's more like 100 years old. Anyways, you might say that like, oh, well, if you have uh, two opposing ideas, that's cognitive dissonance. But the idea is that when you, when you practice analytical third space, you very deliberately say, okay, I have this idea and this idea, and they are incompatible. They are mutually exclusive. But you can play with them like a child plays within a sandbox, and you say, okay, where do they overlap? How do I reconcile them? Can they be reconciled? So this is why I often say that fiction is the playground of the mind, is because you have great scientists and engineers and mathematicians who enjoy fiction, science fiction, Star Trek, and other stuff, and that is the best example of an analytical third space. You say, okay, suspend all disbelief, throw out all the rules, for the sake of argument, let's assume this is true, and then let's run that thought experiment. Our brains are very flexible and, and can do that. So you deliberately uh, ignore the constraints, boundaries, and assumptions that you normally have in the physical world, and you adopt a new set of constraints, boundaries, assumptions, and rules. And so when you practice creating an analytical third space, uh, cognitive dissonance is never actually a problem. And one thing actually that I noticed is that because so few people have this ability, when someone, has, when, when someone actually has the ability to use analytical third space and they can say, oh, hey, like, okay, I'm thinking from this school of thought right now, and it means this, and I do this. So I actually saw someone else doing it very deliberately. It was the Lex Friedman and Ayla uh, podcast. I think it was it was a, it was a, it was an interview that Ayla was on. And they were talking about something, and she's like, oh, well, are you thinking from this school of thought? And then she could switch to another school of thought. And I'm like, oh, I do that. Um, so I think she also intuitively discovered analytical third space. Uh, so basically the question is, which set of assumptions are you making? And when I challenge people with that, a lot of people get really pissed off because they say, I'm not making any assumptions. These are the facts. And so what they've done is they've created a smaller container where they believe that they know everything and they believe that they have intellectual control over it. And it's a very rigid way of thinking. Um, so this leads me to uh, another example of first principles thinking and cross-pollination where I mix this idea, this philosophical intellectual idea of analytical third space with Keegan's theory of cognitive development. So most people, when I say that they put themselves in a container, they are right here. They say this, this set of boundaries, this set of facts, uh, and this, this epistemic tribe that I belong to, this is the truth. And so when I say, what kind of assumptions are you making? People in this state get really pissed off. Um, next, the self-authoring mind, um, basically they're able to see themselves as apart from their epistemic tribe. They're able to look at their epistemic tribe from the outside and say, okay, I see all the beliefs and ideas and constraints and boundaries that my tribe operates by, but I'm going to be apart from that. And then I'm going to very deliberately study that so that I can understand it. And then finally, this is where I am at and a few other people. Uh, but basically, you very deliberately understand every school of thought that you come across, every way of thinking, every epistemic tribe. And so you can say, OK, well, if we're using, you know, the uh, Copenhagen interpretation, that's over here. And if we're using string theory, that's over here. And if we're looking at, you know, post postmodernism and everything is a social construct, that's over here. And so the ability, so this is what Aristotle meant when he allegedly said it is mark of an educated mind to entertain an idea without accepting it, is you hold yourself outside of all of these schools of thought. And this is the, this is the most, one of the most powerful ideas of deliberately finding first principles thinking and being a systems thinker. And then finally, as you practice these things, you will be able to discover universal principles. So I know at the, at the beginning of the video, I said, you know, the social definition of truth is beliefs, evidence, consensus, and, and, uh, and interpretation. The thing is, though, is once you have developed your mind in this way, um, when you've achieved stage five, the self-transforming mind, um, where you can, you don't, you, you realize that you don't actually have to reconcile every paradox or every mutually exclusive paradigm. You can, you can observe them and say, okay, in this context, in this information domain, that makes sense. But there is a gap between that idea and this idea. You can still start to see the linkages between those ideas and find those universal principles. Um, 
So this this idea, the uh, Lawrence Kohlberg's stages of moral development, um, is very similar to Keegan's stages of cognitive development, but this has to do with morality. And so this is the point: is that when you look at uh, when you look at morality and ethics pedagogically through the lens of psychology, suddenly morality makes infinitely more sense that it is learned and that it is a uh, a, that is a, a, a procedure. It is a process. Philosophy, not in the 2,500 years of philosophy's history, never once looked at morality pedagogically. Yes, uh, some people said that like uh, virtues can be learned, but not one of them ever looked at the the progress of learning morality from the perspective of a child growing into an adult. And so this is what I mean by you know, in 2,500 years, philosophy never figured this out. And it was not that, that particularly like difficult to look at, but because of the conventions within philosophy, the, the, the tunnel vision that they, that they created for themselves, philosophers never figured this out. It took a, it took a different school of thought, a different set of tools to find that actually, yes, this framework is how all humans learn moral development. Um, and so, but of course, uh, we are living in the post-truth era, the post-modernist era, which says that there is no such thing as a universal truth, uh, but instead there actually is, and this is the framework by which morality works. Um, yep, so keep searching. Um, if you're still experiencing cognitive dissonance, it's because, one, you're not that good at uh, analytical third space and all this other stuff, so you need to get from here to here to here. Um, so some things you can do if you experience that cognitive dissonance, um, maybe you, you also haven't spent enough time distilling something down into its uh, core essence. You might need more perspectives. Uh, you might still be making assumptions that you're not aware of. You might need a new layer of abstraction. So you might need to go up. You might need to go down. You might still be using the wrong tool. You might still be using the wrong uh, framework or methodology to approach the problem. So here's a short checklist you can use to ask yourself. Um, in order to get to those first principles thinking. Do you have all the facts and evidence? Do you have all the models and frameworks? Do you have all the perspectives and contexts? Do you have all the approaches and methods? Do you have the right insights and ideas? Are you aware of your constraints and, and assumptions? So you can approach becoming a genius very systematically and solve all problems accordingly. All right, so for a quick recap, uh, there's basically five, five elements to... Uh, this part of systems thinking to first principles thinking. Uh, one, unpack all the assumptions that you're making, every single one of them. Uh, number two, look for elegant simplicity. This is like, you know, find the E equals MC squared level of elegant simplicity for anything that you're working on. Uh, number three, cross-pollination, uh, cross-train your brain, uh, become transdisciplinary or a polymath. And again, this is not something that is done you know, it, it's not something that you're born with. It is something that you cultivate deliberately like a garden over many years. Uh, number four, learn to use analytical third space. So the best way to think about that is Keegan's theory of cognitive development, where in the, in the, the final phase, you are able to look at all the schools of thought. Uh, and then finally, five, find those universal principles by being transdisciplinary and by using all of these other tools. And then once you find those universal principles, those are the fundamental axioms by which you can operate. Um, so here's some personal conclusions, just a really quick thing. Uh, this, was, this was modernism, where it's like, yes, we can get to the truth. And so they're digging really quickly to get to the truth, but then postmodernism gave up just before they got to the truth. They said, eh, throw the whole thing out. So it was a hasty generalization um, based in Western insecurity, nihilism, and it was an intellectual temper tantrum. Um, and so this is my criticism of it. Be aware of it. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the video, postmodernism still has a tremendous amount of value, uh, particularly in the ability to question dogma. That being said, don't take it too far. Thank you for watching. I hope you got a lot out of this video.